і, власне, його застосування. Ось питання, які вчора в Google опитувальнику ви задавали, ми передали колегам, тобто Хосе, або їх розкриє зараз, або в наступних серіях значить, семінарів. Тому передаю слово нашому експерту пану Хосе, і він продовжує наш цикл вебінарів. Хосе, the floor is yours. Thank you so much. Let me just uh, share my screen. There we are. Now let's put this slide show. So for today, First of all, thank you for attending. Let's hope that um, the people who decided not to due to the technical reasons will be able to, to get the recording or the YouTube video. So for today, we're going to be uh, presenting um, all the matters regarding business models. So the first thing we're gonna be doing is um, giving a little bit of background of uh, how we um, actually evolved from uh, open banking APIs to uh, a more ecosystem uh, way of doing business. Part of the business models that we are going to be looking at is uh, BAS, business, uh, sorry, uh, banking as a service. Another one is banking as a platform and white label banking. We will have them some uh, focus on products and services. There are many, and uh, we will see also what are the statistics of the most demanding products and services. And then what are the revenue models that we can um, take into account when we uh, try to launch API uh, and other, um, let's say, innovative services. And finally, uh, some case studies that are a successful examples of uh, different API portals and services. And finally, of course, we will be ending with a question and answer uh, session. Um, I will try to make this uh, again uh, as fast as possible. So we really concentrate on the questions that uh, the audience may have. So let's get started. First of all, from open banking to APIs ecosystem. Um, the first um, model that we see, um, at least in Europe, is just a, a legally driven minimal approach. That means that um, the open banking platform uh, is just dealing with the minimal requirements uh, that are mandated by uh, PSD2, essentially account information service providers and uh, payment initiation service providers uh, that are connecting to this platform in order to provide um, account information services or payment initiation services. This is, uh, this is done through um, the standardization bodies that uh, we mentioned yesterday, the Berlin Group, uh, which is the most renowned in Europe. And of course, other international financial markets um, do have um, a very comparable situation as we mentioned yesterday. What happens next? This is evolving, as I mentioned, to a, a banking as a service model. As you can see now, we're introducing uh, the famous uh, trusted third parties. These can be fintechs. Of course, these can be ASAPs or PASP, uh, also portals and app providers. All these are synchronized and linked to the open banking platform. Uh, that provide, for example, um, client data, account data. They can also provide asset management products, loan products, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, there is an interesting uh, model here, which is the white label banking that allows banks and also B2B organizations and digital partners to access different products and individual processes 
and API platforms to provide um, any scalable, uh, let's say, deployment for um, white label accounts or white label bankings. And we will see also some examples later on. There is another model as well, which let's say that focus on, on a fintech hub that is providing uh, these uh, access to account, these uh, scoring, these rating, these, for example, uh, document signature, et cetera, et cetera, through different applications. Um, these are modules that are um, building blocks that are enabling um, the open banking platform to provide these kind of services to uh, the banking industry. And finally, and this is uh, what um, any um, any uh, fintech association, any uh, banking association, and of course the government will try to seek is to actually uh, build a banking ecosystem where um, we have a host of different uh, partners that are providing um, any service to the uh, open banking platform. Um, so that means that um, um, any crowd, uh, crowd uh, lending uh, platform could be addressing the clients uh, directly or um, any e-banking or any Apple store, uh, any application store, uh, either from Google, uh, either from Apple, et cetera, could also be um, actually um, providing these, uh, these services. Today, um, we can see that um, depending on the country, there are, um, let's say, certain elements that are de facto today um, a banking ecosystem and some others that are um, a more uh, banking as a service. Let me just see because my computer is telling me that I am having some internet connection issues. Let me just change to another more stable connection. Just bear with me one second, please. Okay, I hope this one will be much better. Are you still there? Yes, okay. we can see okay. and hear you. All right, so let's move on. Let's move on. Um, so now we're gonna be presenting uh, the concept of uh, uh, banking as a service, banking as a platform and white label banks. There we are. So. What is a banking as a service uh, concept is actually an end-to-end -end process that ensures uh, the completion of any banking service. This is about moving, actually, we're transitioning uh, from a traditional model where everything is packed uh, and provided by uh, a bank to a more dynamic system which is based on microservices and APIs that are accessible through the internet. This is the famous appification of banking. The difference though with uh, a banking of a platform is essentially that um, platform-based models are structures that facilitate the exchange of information. And to do that, they um, leverage digital platforms that simplify the processes of, of uh, banking without uh, dumping any down any capability. This is usually provided by fintech startup companies that, uh, that are partnering with uh, fully digital licensed banks. And this is what, for example, FIDOR, which is a, um, a banking platform um, uh, originated from Germany, is providing this uh, sort of service to many banks that do not have the capability 
of uh, having a core banking system. So what they do is actually they kind of provide the whole um, technology stack and these, uh, let's say, uh, neobank can just focus on the marketing and the design of products and the customer experience to uh, target uh, new customers. And finally, white label banking, which is also very linked to these three concepts, is um, another way of, um, let's say, um, understanding what uh, banking as a service is, uh, which enables fintechs and third parties to showcase um, a company branded front end, while um, again, a, a either a established uh, bank with a license uh, is the one that does all the regulatory compliance. Uh, they offer just core banking features that rebels with major institutions. White level banking uh, is there to stay. And the reason why is essentially because it, it actually uh, makes much faster the go to the go to market strategy and of course the go to market deployment so in essence um, we are breaking down uh, the different processes and we are leaving the technology and the platform part to a third party and we just focus on on the um, customer experience customer service and of course customer design so what is the um, different architecture that we see? In a BAS uh, model, there are three layers. Um, we have uh, the banks underlying uh, the, the layer that serve as a foundation to the bank as a service where we are actually uh, connecting through APIs the ecosystem that we see on top of it. So uh, the ecosystem is the one that uh, will um, connect to the bank because they have, for example, a retail business and they have uh, mobile uh, POSs that are connected to, uh, to the bank clearing system. So the customers of that bank can actually pay, for example, with their mobile phones. Uh, there are also uh, the possibility if you have, for example, a wallet to uh, connect through an API uh, to any retailer, either physical or online retailer, in order to make um, a purchase or in order to make a transfer. And this can be an instant transfer between two different accounts. Similarly, uh, there are other more advanced, um, let's say, services that uh, can also be um, synchronized uh, with the platform. Um, I'm talking about uh, blockchain for uh, distributed um, ledger systems that um, may be connected, for example, to the uh, registry of uh, the property or that can be uh, connected to um, a cryptocurrency platform, et cetera, et cetera. So this is, again, how we decouple the, the ecosystem into the providers the bank as a service platform, which is just a middleware that connects the services of the ecosystem with uh, the banking infrastructure. Now let's see um, in a timeline what is happening after um, the enactment of the PSD2. And of course, this is, um, this is not updated. Uh, we could see even more examples, but I mentioned some of these. Um, th we started this whole process in 2012 when the uh, Credit Agricole, uh, a French bank, um, started uh, to unveil their open, uh, sorry, their app marketplace, giving developer access to the SDK, uh, um, which is, was based on, on APIs. By 2013, uh, Moven, uh, which is a US um, bank, uh, time up with a CBW bank and they use a BAS platform to launch a mobile bank account. BBVA, which is a Spanish bank, they launch Innova Big Data Challenge via an API to third party players. We have also examples in India with Yes Bank, um, in 2014, Fidor, as I mentioned, they offer a Fidor OS, which is a full-fledged uh, BAS platform. This has been, for example, used uh, by O2, which is a, um, a mobile operator 
who, who has operations in Spain, in the UK, in Germany. And in the case of Germany, they are providing uh, a full-fledged uh, banking service. So O2 um, is using feeder platform to offer loans and other products, other banking products. Um, two years later, Citi launches a developer hub and Solaris Bank, and this is a very interesting case too, uh, from the UK launched uh, their API platform. And then as you can see, we move uh, uh, towards uh, our date in 2022, sorry, 2021, and there has been more launches um, from Rails Bank, for instance, we bank in China, they open their API, etc. Shanghai uh, Bank also uh, time apps with Timinus, and they leverage um, again open API to uh, make uh, business more collaborative. So, in a nutshell, um, this is happening, and this is happening for a reason, and we are going to be looking at the reasons why this is important and also why uh, this has advantages for the different players. So what is actually driving the adoption of a banking as a service? Well, first of all, the drivers for this open banking um, uh, let's say model, which is, as I said before, um, op um, banking as a service is actually uh, an open banking uh, business model. Uh, the first thing is that for banks, BAS help to meet customer expectations because at the end of the day, again, they concentrate on what they do best. So the end experience and the digital service are provided in a single window by uh, the experts. From a platform provider perspective, um, BAS give access to a large pool of companies of all different sizes, desiring to consume banking capabilities as service. And finally, um, business and developers, and this is where you um, uh, come into play, you typically face challenges for restricted access to banking capabilities uh, with uh, the employment of uh, a BAS um, platform, um, actually you are being empowered as third party to utilize different financial services that are um, increasing your revenues. What are the advantages? Well, first, we render the capability of purpose-built built capabilities, uh, exposing APIs into a delivery channel uh, of the business. For example, issuing cards, opening bank accounts, onboarding customers, collecting bills, or these are ancillary businesses that are not necessarily all of them um, bank uh, related, but they are uh, part of the banking process. Secondly, uh, it helps companies to remain regulated light. That is very, very important. The reason why is because regulation is becoming more and more complex. And again, what we are doing is decoupling uh, the player's role so everybody focus on what they do best. And finally, and we also mentioned this, um, it allows a faster go to market. Let me give you, um, and this is stating back to what we mentioned yesterday, um, um, a little bit of um, tips around why uh, the regulation um, is actually uh, triggering to some extent um, the adoption of uh, BAS. First of all, um, um, open banking, um, and this is important, um, has a wider connotation as to what a BAS is. The first thing is that uh, it encompasses not only open data and open capabilities, whereas the open banking is just about opening up the capabilities of a service. This is important. One thing is open data, the other is focusing on services. Another important difference is that open banking as a regulatory initiative has laid more emphasis into opening up customer data and consents and not so much about what are the uh, underlying uh, services. And finally, um, BAS does not explicitly deal with the opening of customer data, 
and it's just a pure business model, as I mentioned before, that extracts the complexity of banking and products processes and expose them on a consumable fashion in different services. So this is, this is in a nutshell, the difference between uh, this concept that uh, might be a little bit misleading or uh, there is a misconception between open banking and BAS. What are the implications for uh, players? And again, this implies um, um, fintechs. Well, the regulatory open banking is widely expected to act as a catalyst of BAS rollouts. This is happening today. I show you uh, a few examples in the prior slide. And this is happening, as I said, um, more and more intensively these past years with the launch of uh, new neo banks. The other implication is that uh, the transition to uh, BAS would be easier for banks as, and they will encourage to do so. So there is a, um, let's say, a philosophy uh, within the banks to start outsourcing many of the services and this is where BAS can come into place. And finally, um, the work on standardization is associated with open banking initiative and is also expected to make favorable independent firms to foray into the uh, BAS business as backend integration with banks get much easier due to the standardized APIs. Now let's focus on why BAS is important for banks. First, it allows them to growth in the customer base through partners. A BAS platform is actually partnering with, for example, B2B fintechs and other sort of partners, for example, B2C fintechs too, that brings a networking effect uh, multiplying customer bases. In some other cases, your, uh, your part the partners of, of a bank could also be large distribution platforms that have millions of active users as subscribers. Uh, these can happen, for example, when uh, a bank um, has a strategic alliance with a retailer who has, for example, a lot of loyalty cards uh, that are being used by this retailer. Uh, mixing the advantages of the bank with uh, the customer data that this retailer has in terms of, for example, customer behavior and buying patterns makes uh, a very compelling value proposition for the bank to utilize this data for future, for example, credit or loan granting. Another a strategic importance advantages is that uh, it provides an agile entry and growth to new products and, ver and vertical businesses. Um, again, um, banks are very traditional. They tend to focus on their banking uh, business, uh, which is taking deposits and making loans. But obviously with this, they can go through partnerships into more complementary products and capabilities. We mentioned yesterday a few of them. Uh, let me give you some flavor. Um, me as an SME, I could not only apply for, um, let's say, um, um, a loan or, or any credits for uh, production or for my, or a line of credits for my working capital, but I could also uh, through the bank get, uh, the advice of um, legal counsels um, get um, a very competitive pricing from uh, accountants or tax advisors with which the bank may have some kind of a strategic alliance. It also reduces cost for operations and distribution. And we mentioned this yesterday as well, that um, uh, fintechs uh, can be uh, looking into the top, the top side of the PNL of a bank by increasing the revenues, but could also look at the middle size of the PNL, the middle, the middle part of the B, uh, the PNL by looking into the cost base and try to make 
efficiency gains through a cost reduction because you can be automating the products, you can be automating certain processes, you can be automating the design of the products, you could also be um, uh, reducing the cost of HR management or, for instance, um, IT through outsourcing. These are um, efficient gains that are easily to uh, quantify in terms of, of uh, cost reductions. And finally, um, you also provide a new revenue pool through the monetization of the BAS platform. Um, and we will talk about how to uh, monetize this later on. But in essence, um, you could have a revenue sharing scheme or a one-time setup charges if, for example, you're um, you as a as a association provide an API platform, you could have, for example, one-time setup charges or periodic recurring fees or a combination of these, depending on the way you want to tackle your monetization. So, what are the three main business models that uh, BAS proposes? Well, you have, uh, you have them in this slide. Essentially, um, the most renowned one possibly is the API store. And um, you can see a lot of examples here. Um, so from, from the top side uh, of, of this um, uh, chart, and I'm talking about the um, top right hand corner, we can see, um, for example, PayPal, Forte, Stripe, these are Xcash, etc. These are providers, Baintree, PayHub, etc. These are providers of different um, different services that are can be consumed, and you can see them as legal blocks that can be consumed from uh, the banking perspective, either because they are in the acquiring business or because they are in the card or in the wallet or the transfer business, or because they provide some uh, core banking uh, facilities to the banks. Uh, core banking could very easily be, and this is what uh, we can see here as the second business model, white label platform, which is a B2B2C. You can see here, and I mentioned that before, um, Fedor. Fedor is, as well as, the bank corp providing more than 40 APIs to, uh, to different banks through, uh, as I said, a self-contained core banking system that is plug and play ready to be used for either established bank or more likely for neo banks that have been able to get a license and want to start operations. And finally, um, BAS, could also be a co-branding. This is the case of, for example, Monzo or Revolut, where, um, uh, for example, in the case of Revolut, um, they issue um, a, a card uh, jointly with um, MasterCard, and they are uh, actually um, marketing these, uh, these cards throughout their uh, customer base. The same would apply for Starling. Starling Bank is also using MasterCard, to uh, promote their, uh, their credit cards in a co-branding fashion. This is becoming more and more common. Um, and not only um, we need to think about a pure play bank with a established um, card. Uh, there are, uh, for instance, other, let's say, farther away from the banking business, um, companies like, for example, Tesco, who happens to have a, um, a finance company. And actually that finance company evolved into a bank. Now they are a full licensed bank in the UK and they have an API platform to provide all sorts of services. And some of them are co-branding because um, Tesco um, is co-branding again their, um, their card with other uh, Visa and MasterCard players. 
here we can see um, some flavor of uh, the different um, um, models that I mentioned, white label, co-branding, and the API store uh, in different countries and in different, um, and well, in this case, in different continents from Europe to Asia Pacific, Americas, and Africa. Um, as you can see, uh, it's, it's very interesting that um, um, the API store is relatively um, strong in Asia Pacific, co-branding, but a weight label platform does not exist, whereas in the America it does, and the same would happen in Europe. Um, as, I, as you can see, there are different players that are, and let's focus on, on, the, on the European case. Um, in terms of white label platform, you, has, for, you have, for example, Unex, who is very um, uh, expert in, in uh, open API and open banking platforms. Uh, they're coming from my country in Spain, Fidor Bank, as I mentioned before, they're very strong in Germany and they have uh, a very strong footprint even outside uh, the, uh, the European Union. Um, you also have Solaris Bank or Rates Bank um, uh, from the UK in the first case. In terms of co-branding, Cantox is a, um, a platform for, um, for Forex, which is uh, very, very interesting because they're very efficient and very low price as compared to traditional banks. Or TransferWise, uh, which is, as you know, uh, a platform for making transfers. And then we will see some examples. I'm not going to tell you about uh, BBVA, et cetera, because um, we're going to be covering them in the next few slides. So now talking about products and services. This is a very um, interesting slide. Um, it is a quite comprehensive way to categorize and subcategorize um, the different products that are being used by, uh, by the banking industry. Um, let us not forget that an API is a connector. We mentioned yesterday that an API enables two systems uh, to talk to each other. So actually it is a piece of software. What is interesting is what is underlying the API, which is the service. And that the service is the one that is being usually monetized. Again, we will talk about that later on. So in this, in this slide, we can see that um, the main big categories is either business processes. So we have business processes uh, or APIs as products. We have API lifecycle platforms, again, subcategorized by different, uh, by different subcategories. And then we have backend building tools. Uh, we have integration platforms as a services. We have PSD2 API abstraction services, and we have vertical APIs abstract abstractions too. Again, um, there are sometimes uh, scenarios where uh, the same service is being offered uh, in different subcategories. We have one example here, and there are so many other examples in other parts of, of the ecosystem. Now, what is happening uh, worldwide? This is, a, um, this is an, a statistic uh, made uh, by InnoPay um, last year, and this is, um, this is essentially dividing the third party trusted services into the two different customer segments. <clears throat> On the left hand side, we can see what is happening uh, in the business to business service offering. Essentially, as I mentioned before, white label is possibly the most successful one. Cash management, B2B payments, credit rating and tax assistance is what uh, business are demanding more and more. And credit rating um, is also uh, a bank who is actually consuming this because the bank at the end of the day is another business. 
Whereas if we focus into the consumer segment, uh, the most uh, consumed service is personal finance management. These are the classical tools, apps that you have to compare mortgages, to compare, uh, for example, also credits, to compare insurance products, and they also help you out if they can have access to your account data to manage your expenses and your revenues, and even to plan for uh, pensions, to plan for uh, also savings, et cetera, et cetera. The second one, it's also a very usual uh, suspect, which is payment initiation services, credit rating as well, investment service providers and loyalty programs. We mentioned that earlier, loyalty programs are a very, very interesting way of monetizing customer data because the retailers that are actually offering loyalty programs, loyalty points, and we can think about distribution like macro in Germany and in many other countries. We can think about uh, airlines who provide air miles, et cetera. They have a wealth of information about customer um, patterns of consumption. And this can be uh, with the appropriate uh, insights, the appropriate data scientist uh, capabilities, uh, being able to uh, get, uh, let's say, uh, from data to information and make that information actionable through different uh, marketing initiative and new service offerings. So what are the revenue models here? We have two distinct uh, models. One is a direct monetization and the other is indirect monetization. When we talk about direct monetization, what, uh, what banks do pursuing a BAS business model is essentially to get paid by third parties for the use of their APIs. Or conversely, they can use the third parties APIs to distribute their APIs on their behalf for a fee. Let's see um, these, um, these three main modes of doing doing this uh, direct monetization. The first one, which is very popular, is freemium. So um, I have an API, uh, which is, um, which is um, underlying, as I said before, a product or a service, but I want the consumers to test my product. How do I do that? We usually buy offering it for free. And once uh, we get more and more users, we can then decide whether we make this uh, for, for, for a charge uh, price or whether I limit some capabilities, some features, and the others are for free and a certain advanced, and that's why it's called freemium, which is a contraction from free press premium. Some premium features are uh, charged. And one example of this is, for example, uh, LinkedIn. Um, you register for LinkedIn, LinkedIn is for free, but if you want to see who is looking at your profile um, or if you're a um, headhunter or a search firm um, or an HR uh, looking for different profiles, then you will need to sign up for add-on services, which will cost you money. The other example is third-party pays, so beyond free access. Um, we establish a model where the third party pays for the use of the API. And this is usually done with three different pricing models. Either it's tired, so there is a volume discount, depending on how many of your uh, APIs are being consumed in terms of numbers, uh, the more they are being consumed, the cheaper it gets. So it's tired. Uh, from zero to let's say 100,000, this is the price from 1,001 until uh, 1 million, this is the other price, et cetera, et cetera. Pay as you go is essentially what uh, we do in, in, many, uh, in, many, in many services where we pay just for the consumption of what we do. And unit base is that um, we are 
uh, getting charged by the units that are being consumed. Uh, the difference between pay as you go is that um, um, not all the services can be measured, okay? For example, electricity can be metered. So um, it, is, it is a pay as you go and unit based at the same time. And then third party gets paid. In these cases, uh, bank pay third parties for using their APIs. So this is where you come into play. Um, you as a FinTech, you're, uh, you're providing uh, an API and that um, is allowing the bank to generate new products or services uh, for the bank. And they can play you per click. They can pay you per new customer acquisition. They can pay you because they get a referral. There are many ways to do this. This is the direct monetization model. But also banks can also pursue BAS models uh, to leverage APIs to increase the reach, the awareness of their brand to improve partner integration or to reduce cost. Let's see uh, the first one, increase of reach and, and awareness. Um, again, other distribution channels could be used to grow the customer base through cross-selling uh, to existing or to new customers. Uh, a good example of this could be when a bank decide to partner with uh, usually with renowned brands. So uh, a renowned bank will, for example, partner with um, an airliner and they will be uh, issuing, for example, a credit card. And the, the, the way uh, it works is that uh, there will be some co-branding and some uh, other cross-sell um, services. So uh, the bank can offer um, discounting hotels, they can offer discounting rental uh, car services, et cetera, et cetera. All that is uh, increasing the awareness of the partner as well as the awareness of the brand of the bank. In terms of improved partner integration, bank can improve the partner channel experience by introducing APIs as part of the day-to-day -day, uh, customer journeys. And finally, reducing cost because they utilize APIs to optimize the internal processes and to reduce the cost. Again, this is uh, what we mentioned uh, uh, earlier, when uh, you as a FinTech provide services that, uh, for example, automate uh, their internal processes. A good example would be uh, robotic process automation solutions. Another one is anything related to credit scoring, which is, as you know, uh, the core of a bank is to provide credit. So if you can provide um, alternative data, full integration with, for example, MNOs, data with um, credit um, bureau and with some other very advanced, uh, for example, machine learning or artificial intelligence solutions, then um, the credit scoring could be very precise and will be able to help the, uh, the bank to provide more loans. And obviously um, uh, that is uh, an indirect um, monetization because they're reducing the cost. And as I mentioned yesterday, any reduction of cost is de facto an increase of my revenue. Now let's focus on the last section, which is the case studies. Well, somebody asked me, uh, what are the yesterday? And I promised to answer that question. So what are good examples of, of what's going on in terms of, of the, um, the banking experience uh, related to APIs? So we have a matrix here. On the vertical axis, we have the functional scope. So the more on the top that you are, the richer your API scope is. And then in terms of developer experience, uh, the more comprehensive experience for the developers so that you actually provide a sort of tools, not only just a developer portal, but also uh, a toolkit for development, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, the more, uh, let's say, advanced that you are mastering or being a leader in these uh, 
comprehensive experience for developers. And we have here, um, most of them are uh, European banks with BBVA, Deutsche Bank, Nordea from, uh, from the Nordics, and Capital One, which is an American bank. But we also have FIDOR, as you can see there, um, Royal Bank of Scotland uh, from the UK, ABM, AMRO, and ING from the Netherlands, uh, et cetera, et cetera. On top of the of this quadrant, this uh, magic quadrant, the top right-hand side one, we also see uh, some of the examples that we mentioned in the in the in the timeline with OCBC Bank from China, TPS uh, from Southeast Asia, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So now let's focus on on a few examples about these uh, APIs. I'm taking again the the slide, uh, the the chart of of the of the APIs and how these APIs are just a connector of different services provided by IDEN, provided by PayPal, and are fitting into this building block that you see in my in my mouse cursor for core banking solutions, for acquiring solutions, et cetera. And a good example is German number 26 or N26, which is rebundling um, and creating a tight knit integration with the startups that focuses on a specific vertical. So what is actually doing this neobank is try to see what are the best of breed players so they can partner with them in order to provide um, a very, let's say, good customer experience on the one hand and at a very good pricing on the other for different banking services. One example uh, is a number 26 bank account now access WISE. It's the former transfer WISE uh, cost-cutting currency exchange uh, service. So if I am receiving dollars and I want to uh, convert them into Iverna, uh, in Ivna in the, in, in the Ukrainian currency, um, I can use uh, N26 and the uh, WISE platform to do so and get a conversion at a very interesting uh, Forex exchange rate. Another example, and this is uh, probably coming from one of the world champions that uh, we uh, we saw yesterday. Uh, sorry, in the prior slide, uh, we have BVBA. BVBA um, is a 150 years old Spanish bank. They have uh, an API market. Um, this market is is um, clustered with the taxonomy that um, I have put here uh, on the right hand side. Um, they have retail accounts where they can offer customer loans, notifications, Alipay. Um, they have business where they have business accounts, business global position, business notifications, et cetera, et cetera. And they provide also data uh, with uh, sell or pay stats. In other words, they are providing um, a number of interesting services to automate, for example, customer onboarding to allow um, retail accounts to uh, get access to loans provided by third parties or provided by the bank itself. Another interesting case is the UK bank Barclays. They have a developer API catalog. You have here um, these, uh, this catalog and essentially um, it's divided into open banking, open data APIs and experimental APIs. This is very interesting because not only they put the usual suspects of open data or open banking, but also experimental uh, APIs like uh, even validator, uh, loan calculator, sort code vali uh, validation, uh, card details, et cetera, et cetera. And you can add as many as you can think of because at the end of the day, uh, this is about uh, providing um, value to uh, their banking customers. Also uh, usual suspect ones you can see here, like for example, check of a balance, uh, another one uh, which is widely used for most of the banks across the world is a locator of branches, 
a locator of ATM, and of course, anything related to bank account details, uh, confirmation of funds, and this is part of uh, payment initiation uh, services, et cetera, et cetera. NatWest is a very interesting case too. NatWest is again, uh, National Westminster Bank from the UK. They have an API product catalog and they have um, different, uh, different uh, taxonomies. One of them is what they call uh, partner APIs. So they're providing uh, partners to provide native loans uh, from their partners, et cetera, et cetera. They have also other specific um, payment uh, solutions like paid, et cetera, et cetera. Um, it's interesting because um, NatWest uh, dubbed, uh, dubbed themselves as the bank of APIs, as you can see in the source uh, over here, they are trying to position themselves as the bank of APIs, again, from the UK. Um, and this is, this is another example, again, from the UK, HSBC, where they have this developer API catalog divided by just two uh, categories uh, in their taxonomy, either open banking implementation enterprise or open data APIs. As you can see, the common denominator of all these uh, taxonomies is on the one hand, open banking, on the other one, open data. Um, somebody also asked me yesterday, um, Jose, um, what would you say is, uh, one of the most advanced markets. And uh, I mentioned that although there is little history in, uh, in uh, the case of, of open banking, because it has been launched relatively uh, not a long time ago, um, the UK uh, had a little bit more advantage towards their uh, continental European peers for the very reason that they were the first to, in, to um, conceptualize open banking and they were the first to actually uh, launch uh, their, uh, their solutions in the marketplace, in this case, in the UK. And of course, this uh, has been also being transferred to uh, uh, where the UK banks have uh, international presence. And I think with that, we are done. Um, I have even run faster than I did yesterday, which took me um, an hour. And uh, this has been uh, roughly um, slightly more than 45 minutes. Um, I understand that, that there is a lot of content, that this content is as complex or even more complex than what we saw yesterday. Um, some of these... Um, before we get into the questions, some of these business models are evolving. So um, there is no magic uh, solution uh, for, for uh, the Ukrainian banks or for the fintechs to really bet for one or the other. Um, the, the business models that you may need to, uh, to take into account uh, would be to make a compromise between the resources you have the ambitions that you have and the ambitions of your partner banks. And again, do not forget that um, we are still without um, um, an enacted uh, payment system law. So there is uh, still no legislation for um, this um, opening of data, open API, but um, this is gonna happen anytime soon in the next uh, few months, therefore, um, it's, it's about time for you to get prepared about making a call of what are the services that you would like to expose through APIs to be offered by banks. If uh, the open API platform goes ahead, um, which are the services, the products that you're going to be exposing in that platform to, and also and not less important is how would you like to monetize your APIs? And remember here that in many cases, APIs may not uh, may be offered for free. 
and we need to devise how uh, those, uh, let's say, APIs that are being offered for free can be turned into revenues later through a conversion of customers uh, into customers of your service, into a freemium model, et cetera, et cetera. So after having said this as a recap, let's move into the questions. I'm sure the audience will have a number of questions that if I can and be able to answer, I will be happy to do so. If not, um, I will write them down and try to research for a suitable answer for you. The, open, the floor is open for questions then. Mm -hmm. Colleague, so I can see. Yes, I can see one question in chat. I will read it. Uh, many thanks, Jose. Very interesting. We are already seeing in the Ukrainian market examples of launching projects similar to BAAS before PSD2 was implemented. How, in your view, PSD2 implementation could fun fundamentally change this trend? Well, actually, um, the as I mentioned in one of the slides, the the PSD2, uh, what happens is that they act as a catalyst for, um, for, um, for, <laughs> for um, BSS uh, to be a mainstream. So um, it started even uh, before the enactment of, of uh, PSD2, uh, when the Credit Agricole started uh, this SDK, and uh, which was based on, on APIs. And then they realized that they could expose uh, different APIs uh, for uh, different banking services. So if, if, if there is anything that uh, will happen in the, or has happened already is that PSD2 has actually accelerated the path for, uh, for um, any uh, BAS uh, value proposition in, at least in the European market. There are more and more uh, fintechs coming up to propose either platforms, the case of Fidor, or banks who uh, realize that um, they should become more and more like, a, like a, a supermarket of financial services. And with open architecture, they are providing, uh, providing access to, uh, for example, worldwide uh, uh, fund managers to get access to investment funds, to pension funds, et cetera, et cetera. So BAS at the end of the day is gonna allow banks, if they're, let's say, brave enough and not you know, uh, be reticent in the adoption of BAS uh, to actually differentiate themselves in the marketplace because they offer value added services that are valued for the customer. So again, if you allow me, another thing that both US fintechs and banks need to think of is um, we need to put ourselves in the shoes of the customer and try to evaluate what are their needs and what sort of services are they demanding. And this can be explicitly demanded or implicitly demanded. So sometimes the trend is there, nobody understood why, and then they realize, hey, but this is what we wanted. A good example is this one. Nobody ever thought about a touch screen. And then Apple launched the iPhone. And then everybody was so happy because rather than interacting with, with a button pad, they could just use their fingertips uh, throughout the screen uh, to write messages or to navigate. That was a breakthrough. Nobody ever asked, I want to have a, a touch screen. Any more questions? Oh, sorry. First of all, have I answered your question at all? Hello. 
Так, більше питань поки що нема. Окей. So, Jose, I think uh, you give such a uh, big uh, information plus that everybody will rethink it. And I think we will have later uh, more questions so we could use them to plan our next webinar. So, yes, we have two more questions. So, Anastasia, the floor is yours. Yes, okay. I will read it in Ukrainian. Приклади, які ви вказали, стосуються переважно окремих банків. Ці банки мають власні АПІ або використовують універсальні, як розроблені для ринку асоціацією або регулятором. Які розроблені для ринку асоціацією або регулятором. Mm. I, don't, I don't follow the question, sorry. Can you repeat again? Mm. Так, мені здається, що не закінчене запитання, але я можу помилятись. Давайте я ще раз прочитаю. Або, Олександр, можливо, ви його озвучите українською? Окей, є продовження. Так, приклади, які ви вказали, стосуються переважно окремих банків. Ці банки мають власні АПІ або використовують універсальні, які розроблені для ринку асоціацією або регулятором. А, це запитання. Ці банки мають власні АПІ або використовують універсальні, які розроблені для ринку асоціацією або регулятором? Окей. Okay. Well, first of all, the regulator doesn't, doesn't usually uh, develop APIs. It's, it's far from their mandate. Uh, we mentioned yesterday uh, that... Uh, Regulators in Europe are focusing on financial instability and price control containing inflation. In the case of the UK, they were slightly different because the FCA has a, has a, <coughs> excuse me, as part of their mandate to foster competition. And in the case of AMS, M M MAS, Monetary Authority of Singapore, uh, one of their mandate was actually to, um, to foster innovation. Therefore, in Europe, no single uh, regulator, to my, to my knowledge, is actually uh, developing APIs. The other question is, okay, um, are the banks developing APIs or are they exposing APIs from third parties? My answer is both. Um, they usually started by um, exposing uh, some APIs developed by them because the first or the pioneers of open API have been uh, usually larger banks because they had the capabilities to do so. The examples that you see from the UK is because out of the vast array of UK banks, only nine, the largest nine, are being uh, uh, mandated to, uh, to expose their APIs. And in this case, these are APIs that are being done by fair parties and that has been also uh, provided by, um, by the bank themselves. In the case of um, uh, not the UK, but continental banks, uh, you have the, the VVVA example, where you see that some of these are uh, uh, to expose uh, data. So for example, retail accounts, customer, this is something that the bank has uh, developed. However, Alipay, and you can see Alipay, this is a third party API. The same thing would apply for Cell, uh, which is data analytics. Uh, this is done by a third party, pay stats which is also data analytics is the same one, but business notifications, business account is being developed uh, by, um, by uh, the, the own bank uh, in order to, uh, for example, get bank account statements, et cetera, et cetera. And also banks uh, do have to um, develop uh, the minimal requirements of the PSD2, which is um, they need to develop an API to expose that API so other uh, fintechs can get access to A, the customer, uh, their customer data, 
arm B uh, to initiate uh, a payment on their customer uh, behalf. In that case, uh, payment initiation and customer data APIs are being exposed and developed by the bank. Now, whether that development is being actually done by internal developers or it has been outsourced, that's a different story, but the obligation still lays on the bank. But usually all these applications that you see, uh, you can see here more applications as opposed to this example, many of these applications have been actually developed by uh, third parties. So that would answer the first part of your question. I don't know if I made myself clear. Is it clear or do you need further explanation? Because that, I think that's a very relevant question. We have one more question. Хотел поблагодарить Хосе за развернутый ответ на мой вчерашний вопрос об успешных примерах внедрения BAS. Вопрос. BAS – это новый бизнес, новая бизнес-модель наравне с розницей и корпоративным бизнесом? Окей. BAS is actually a... Um, a business model that applies for uh, both uh, retail businesses and sorry for retail uh, retail customers usual customers individuals as well as for uh, for corporate customers and smes okay um uh, let me give you another example um typically uh, wealth management is another binding block that uh, many uh, European banks are offering um, through banking as a service, providing a more value added, like, as I said, uh, like a big uh, supermarket of, of investment funds from around the globe. So you have a list of all listed possibly uh, investment funds in the US, uh, in Australia, in Japan, etc., in China, and then you can pick up which ones depending on your uh, risk profile uh, uh, and your risk appetite are the ones that fits your need most. This is a good example of, uh, of uh, an API exposing all these services uh, done through BAS for, uh, for individuals. But treasury solutions, and there is a very good example here which uh, which is provided by Cantox, okay? Cantox, let me get back here. Cantox is a Barcelona in Spain based uh, European uh, company that is uh, being one of the leaders in Europe for making um, um, Forex uh, conversion at a very, very um, interesting um, uh, forex exchange rate um, because they are actually you know playing with arbitrage between different markets that's why they can provide uh, such a good uh, uh, forex rates they are their customers are only uh, companies and within those customer profiles those companies are usually uh, uh, large companies that do import export so they are uh, getting being paid uh, for example uh, in, in dollars and they need to, um, uh, you know, uh, take those dollars and convert them into euros or conversely, um, they produce in euros, they export and sometimes they get paid directly in euros. But most of the time, as you know, uh, international trade is being still today being paid in dollars. Therefore, um, they, they, um, they get uh, to uh, convert those euros into dollars. Or now China is asking uh, more and more their European partners, especially European partners, to uh, start not using dollars, but using the Chinese currency, the yuan, 
And for that reason, uh, Cantox come into play because they can offer very interesting uh, exchange rates for, uh, for the Chinese currency. That is a good example of, of a solution which is specifically targeted for, uh, for uh, companies. So both, both um, targets, individuals and also uh, corporate customers are essentially benefiting from uh, BAS or BAP because of the reasons I stated. Because again, forget about, and this is very important, let's forget about technology. The beauty of BAS and BAP, BAAP is that they decouple technology from services. And you as bank or you as FinTech, you need to concentrate on providing value added services and, and forget about technology. Technology, it's been either provided by the bank itself or provided by, uh, by a third party. This could be Fedora, could be Unex, could be others. <clears throat> Even Solaris Bank can uh, you know, provide uh, their own platform to third parties so that they're benefiting from the underlying technology and the focus on either corporate SMEs or individual solutions is what uh, the banks and also uh, the fintechs are focusing on. Because don't forget that the banks are also uh, looking for fintechs to enhance their value proposition. Banks, and, um, and um, this, is, this is hard to, to admit, but uh, banks are very conservative. You know that already, and banks, tend to rely on the innovation which is done by fair parties. By definition, uh, banks are not as innovative as other companies are. And we don't necessarily need to think about big techs who have deep pockets to innovate, but also small companies that started small and are you know, um, identifying customer needs that are not being addressed by the market and that business opportunity is turned down into a service which can be monetized. And this is what I believe US FinTech should be uh, focusing on. Okay, we have one more question. Чи є приклади інтеграторів API, з якими інтегруються провайдери послуг, TPP, і отримають доступ до всіх API різних банків? Чи кожен TPP інтегрується з кожним банком напряму? Okay. There are there are there the two are are existing. So you could <clears throat> you could have aggregators. Um, um, there are good examples. Um, one of them is is what uh, what uh, the IFC, my organization, has done with ASEAN, uh, which is the Association of Southeast uh, Countries. Uh, in Singapore, we have a platform that is called APIX, A-P-X, okay? So A-P-I-X, API from uh, Application Programming Interface and X from Exchange. So what this, what this, um, API um, platform is doing is actually to provide a one-stop shop for uh, cross-border banks, cross-border fintechs in the region to provide their services in just one platform. So it's a one-stop shop solution. So that exists. And there are examples of these aggregators at either regional level or sometimes there are uh, initiatives at uh, national level. And as you may know, uh, your association has the aspiration to launch an API platform. We are actually starting the collaboration with you guys in order to launch this. So these aggregators do exist. The other alternative is that the bank expose an API and then any, any, any who wants to use 
their service uh, or provide uh, as a third party a service, they, um, they connect their service directly to the bank using the APIs they're exposed. Again, do not forget that an API is no more than a piece of software that connect their system, in this case, the system of the bank with your system, in this case, your product, who is going to interact most likely with customer data in order to provide any service, can be payment or can be any other thing that we can think of, of course, uh, within, within uh, the legal boundaries of uh, the payments law. And both, both do exist. Okay, so the platform, there's a good example in your country that will become in the future and at regional level. And then anything which is uh, bank specific, you have here the examples where banks are exposing APIs for third parties to uh, provide their own services. And the way this is done is because then uh, your, your service will appear, for example, here in this spot, there is a gap, there is no service, and you will be exposing your API, okay? So that uh, bank customers can use it, download it and, and use it in their, in their mobile apps, for example, or the bank can use it internally. Uh, and then um, this may not be, um, uh, necessarily, uh, well, it has to be exposed in this API catalog even for, for internal purposes. Because that's, uh, that's how uh, the, the API uh, world with open banking is, is actually working. Have I answered your question? Yes, thank you. Колеги, чи є у вас ще якісь запитання? Якщо є, ви можете писати в чат, а можете просто включати мікрофон і задавати запитання. Поки що я не бачу запитань більше. Mm -hmm. I'm sure there will be many, but I guess um, some of these uh, could most likely be answered uh, in the next, uh, I would say, few months when we start working with uh, the API platform. Okay, so Jose, thank you very much for this today's being with us and share with us your knowledge. Uh, so thank you very much, колеги, дякую за ваш час, за вашу увагу. Ми за якийсь час викладемо це відео в наш YouTube канал. Всім гарних вихідних і продовжимо роботу в цьому напрямку після свят. Дякую. Побачення. Okay. Jose, thank you. Uh, I received also a lot of thanks on my email as I am a host. So people okay. are telling thanks. Excellent. Thank you so much. It has been a pleasure. And please, by all means, any further questions that you may have, I uh, will try to answer them. Okay, bye-bye. Bye-bye.